My main reason for writing 25 Million Sparks was to tell a story that reflected the dignity, uh, creativity, and equality of refugee communities around the world. Um, and the, the kind of initial purpose behind it, or the initial spark for me personally was, um, I'm very proud of my parents' immigrant story. Um, they immigrated from Egypt, um, have lived in, in the U.S. for the past um, almost 40 years, uh, and made such a big difference in their community here in uh, my hometown of, in Florida. Um, my dad is a primary care physician, and my mom is a preschool teacher. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, when I started writing the book, or when I started thinking about writing the book in 2018, there's such a um, strange disconnect between what we see in the media about immigrant communities. And as I got more into it, particularly refugee communities, even more so. Um, between that, what you hear about them and what actually is happening on the ground and the kind of beauty and joy and kindness and innovation that they bring to communities across the US and across the world. Uh, and so um, I wanted to tell a story that broke through this kind of politicized cloud of what you hear about and got straight to kind of the human story, which is um, a story of people who are often dealing with the most difficult things, refugees, uh, the most difficult kind of life altering events, uh, the most kind of significant trauma, and yet are able to uplift their communities and bring great spirit and kindness and joy to those communities. Uh, and so my parents' story is a bit different because they were immigrants, they weren't kind of forced to flee um, but that kind of is, was the window into the story about refugees. And then a lot of my own personal work with, um, DreamX America and Mona, two of the social ventures I started, I got to know more and more refugee entrepreneurs, and I wanted to use entrepreneurship as the angle, um, to tell that story because it's such a vibrant element of the refugee story. There were two times where I think I, I said to myself, I would really like to write a book about this. And I felt compelled and kind of moved to write a book about it. The first was in the summer of 2018. I remember sitting at home watching news clips uh, about the Central American migrants who were headed to the border. Um, at that time, there was uh, a more, more, than, uh, more than kind of had been in the past uh, headed to the border uh, to, to cross into the United States as asylum seekers. Um, and many of these people uh, are fleeing kind of persecution, violence, uh, mistreatment of all kinds. Uh, and you see them on the screen, and these are human beings with families who are incredible, uh, you know, dealing with incredible um, difficulty and yet pushing forward, um, trying to do something to kind of keep their families safe. You know, they're people who, if we got to know them, are certainly creative, um, powerful, kind of beautiful people. And yet all you see, unfortunately, is them at their kind of weakest moment and their kind of um, most difficult moment. And unfortunately, it gets more pernicious uh, where, you know, you have rhetoric from certain folks who, who will say these people are going to come and destroy our country. They're going to take our jobs. They're going to bring violence, all of which is kind of demonstrably untrue if you look at the statistics. And so um, what I felt very compelled about was how can we break through all of this political kind of cloud and tell a story that uh, reflects the humanity, the dignity, the creativity of these folks and other refugee and asylum seekers around the world so that uh, maybe we can kind of create that bridge of humanity that could potentially bring a breakthrough in terms of policy and other things. But most importantly, just at the first level, understand who they are and have that kind of common humanity and empathy. Um, and so that was kind of the first moment. Uh, it's seeing these folks portrayed solely as victims and not seeing, uh, they're not having um, see, gotten the chance to see their full stories. And so I wanted to try to present that because I believe at the end of the day, through kind of human-centered storytelling, people want to unite and they want to care for each other and they want to connect. And so if you can give that to folks, hopefully they can start seeing things from, you know, the perspective of a Central American asylum seeker or a Syrian refugee. Um, and the second moment was, as I was writing it, um, or beginning to research and uh, traveling to different places um, and, you know, just reflecting on my own work, um, working on supporting refugee and immigrant entrepreneurs with zero interest loans. I got to know a lot more people. And um, I think the more people I got to know, the more it was like 
continuous moments of saying, I need to write this and I need to feature this person and this person. And in particular, it was at the Zetri camp, which is kind of the central location of the storytelling. Uh, and I think uh, even more specifically, like each of the three um, women, Esma Melek and Yasmina, who are featured um, as kind of the primary entrepreneurs in the book, each time I met them, it was, you know, I, I have to tell the story. Um, you know, Esma in particular, uh, as one example, all three of them, but if, if one example, sitting in her trailer and watching her, uh, you know, the kids come into the room and watching her kind of do the storytelling with the kids and how much they seem to appreciate and love her and how much she cared about uh, empowering them and, and bringing them a new kind of hope and light in their lives. Um, when I watched that and then talked with her much more, um, it, I felt like I, I had to tell that story because this is something that, unfortunately, a side that maybe a lot of people won't see uh, in the Syrian refugee crisis. And, and so the way I kind of put that is, how do we divorce the ugliness of the situation uh, from the beauty of the people? How do we make sure the beauty shines through? And so, uh, unfortunately, when you think of the, the Syrian refugee crisis, and when, when many people even hear about Syria, they'll only see... Um, the images of victimization and, and of sadness and of war and of disaster. They won't see the kind of power and beauty of Esma Melek and Yasmina Iman and so many others. And so uh, that was the second moment is when I was at the camp saying, you know, talking to these folks. My hope is that folks who maybe have a perception of refugees that is divorced from reality, whether it's because of politics or media or whatever it is, that they are either victims or villains, either one dimensionally kind of weak and don't have their own agency um, or are you know, villains coming to take our jobs or create problems, uh, that they read the book, they see the human stories and they see the backed up statistics and um, narrative about uh, what refugees bring to our countries. And they realize that actually these people are equal um, to me, and in fact, some of the most entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, powerful, brave, and inspiring human beings that we would be honored to welcome into our country on a moral uh, perspective, even if it wasn't for the economics and the other things, we should be welcoming and giving these folks a shot at um, another life, um, given that you know our, our global kind of system has failed them in making them have to flee their countries in the first place. I think there's many different things that uh, folks can do in their communities to help support refugees. Um, you know, obviously there's a there's a money element. So if folks have the ability, either themselves or their companies that they work for, or their um, uh, faith institutions that they attend, uh, if they have the ability to contribute, there are many kind of opportunities. One, I think locally they're often refugee relocation groups or centers or nonprofits that you can work with and that you can donate to and that are often understaffed and underfunded. And so these are folks who are just on the front lines of helping support refugees to get, you know, initial housing, initial job, um, you know, uh, uh, language services if they need to, to learn English uh, or whatever language that, that you're going to. Um, so all of that is is great if you can provide that kind of funding and donation and support during you know, gifting programs for your company or, or yourself. Um, there are other kind of international organizations you can support um, that work in the camps, uh, like Save the Children, Norwegian Refugee Council, UNHCR, things like that. Um, you know, I always recommend starting local uh, because there are often, you know, depending on where you live, there's often many refugees who um, are you know doing everything they can uh, and could use that support. Um, the, you know the other thing aside from money is is volunteering your your abilities. And so again, these organizations are often understaffed and could use the support. So if you're um, you know marketing lawyer, whatever it is, you can lend that expertise uh, and just offer to help and volunteer. And the other thing too is is even just if you know a refugee in your community, uh, welcoming them and and even like simple kind words make a, a huge difference because at the end of the day these are folks who are doing everything they can to integrate and create a new life and you know having at, even one person who's a source of either connections or or networks or just helping navigate can make a dramatic difference um, and so yeah even just 
like hand to hand, like if you know people in your community, uh, if you can go volunteer and get to know people, being a resource that they can text or call is immensely important because you can imagine going somewhere with absolutely no network would be very difficult.